Very good. Thank you very much. That was excellent summary on ET, where I uh, agree with uh, Stephen that hopefully we will have a more uh, clinical studies on use of uh, ruxolitinib and perhaps other new medications, particularly super long acting interferons uh, in that disease where we need more options. Now we're going to go to polycetimia vera, and uh, I will talk about uh, the same type of medication. Some are on label, like ruxolitinib, some are off label, like interference, but it's all familiar to you. So the, our case here is uh, another 71 year old gentleman, but this time with polycetimia vera, you see here the basic information about the case. He was managed successfully for some time with a good dose of hydroxyurea, one pill twice a day, which is 500 milligrams tablets, and uh, now he comes with a non-healing leg ulcer and some other problems, and uh, in addition, still requires some phlebotomy. So it's not that he's doing well at this moment, and he's coming for advice. His count is shown here. Uh, hematocrit is way above what we would like to know or have in a polycetemia vera, above 45, elevation in white cells, platelets, and uh, you have here other findings, including iron deficiency, as evident by low ferritin. Spleen is uh, palpable to a little degree, and a bone marrow was done, and it did not actually show a high grade of fibrosis. And therefore, the question is what to do next. So what do we do usually for a polycetemia vera? Mirrors to great extent what was presented for essential thrombocytemia. We give patients low-dose aspirin, we manage cardiovascular risk factors, and then look at the risk for thrombosis and decide whether we want to introduce cytoreductive therapy or not. And you see that uh, the first bullet on the high-risk disease is age over 60 and previous history of thrombosis, as is for ET. Nothing really ha changed here, and this patient is 71. He was treated properly with cytoreductive therapy. There are other instances that lead us to treatment, even if the patient has no high risk, and they are listed here, and one that I'd like to highlight is the plated number above a million and a half. This is tied to a risk for bleeding associated with acquired and one million factor deficiency. Plated number otherwise on its own is not a risk factor for thrombosis, it seems. Now, what is good to see also here is that severe disease-related symptoms are on the list where we are actually talking about the people, person, not just about the numbers, so that's good. Now, how to assess response? I also quote the European Leukemia Net definitions of response that are similar to ET, with addition, obviously, of a hematocrit control. So we would like to go beyond hematocrit control below 45% to control of the platelets, white cell spleen, and symptoms. That would be complete response. So in the clinical studies in particular, we like to say we want to control everything, all the signs and symptoms of the disease, all the five factors, and these are being usually assessed in a clinical trial setting. Definition of partial response is provided as well here, as well as no response. So we are beyond just the red blood cell count. However, the control of hematocrit below 45% has been, and the, the only one of these five factors, validated in prospective randomized studies to mean anything, right? So everybody is probably aware of this study published in January 2013, where uh, patients were randomized, patients with PV and high-risk for thrombosis, to tightly control hematocrit below 45 or not, meaning above 45, between 45 and 50. And these are representations of some of the results saying that the cardiovascular-related deaths, major thrombosis, and overall cardiovascular events are three to four times more prominent if you do not control hematocrit well. So I think that is a very uh, powerful message for us to really try to control hematocrit below 45. And in my case, I like to have this all the time. And if I introduce cytoreductive therapy, then my goal is to eliminate the need for phlebotomy and have that 45% on all the measurements if I can, in a safe way, provide the cytoreductive therapy, not to do the partial job. Now, other factors are important for a patient's well-being. Perhaps they're not proven that to, serve, to uh, have anything to do with thromboembolic events or otherwise, but certainly control of the symptoms is important for patients' quality of life. And Ruben Mesa uh, here, a uh, friend and colleague, has done a tremendous job in identifying and uh, developing tools for assessment 
of the quality of life, and this is one summary from his uh, many studies saying that patients with ETP, via malofibrosis, in general have a very poor quality of life in many aspects, as you can see here. Now, white cell count is a hot topic, I would say, in the uh, uh, attempt to perhaps uh, improve uh, risk assessment. This is the one, uh, uh, number one, usually on the list, because there are a number of retrospective studies, I would say probably at least seven papers, saying that if you have a high white cell count, you may be at a high risk for thrombosis. That's a summary of two papers on this slide. And a high risk of transformation as well as a risk of death. Um, but there are problems with these particular assessments. It's all retrospective. The number of uh, white cells, uh, meaning cutoff for assessment of significance, is different in different papers. And again, nobody proved really, really well in perspective way that the normalization of white cell count means anything for a patient. So we are not ready yet to utilize any cutoff for white cells to say that's significant, but progressive leukocytosis certainly calls for introduction of site reductive therapy. And then how do we assess then the quality of a response? It used to be controlling the red blood cell count. Since uh, we now look at five factors, we also have a number of ways to look at uh, a failure of a therapy. So need for phlebotomy, uncontrolled mild proliferation. You see all the five factors here. The first four are usually related to uh, resistance, and the last one is clearly intolerance. Uh, these are non-hematological toxicity. Now, how did we come up with these definitions? This is uh, like we are doing things today. Experts in the room came up uh, together and tried to define what would that be that we call a resistance. Uh, intolerance is quite clear, but resistance is always open to a debate. Uh, what is the time period of observation on what dose of cytotoxic therapy? And uh, many object to that, but this is what we have right now, and it's particularly useful in clinical trial designs. So if you ask a question, like it was in previous talk, how well hydroxyurea does if you utilize this uh, assessment tools that we came about in consensus statements, then you would see that about 10% of the patients are resistant and some about 10% of the patients are intolerant to hydroxyurea. That develops over time. I'm not talking about acute uh, uh, problems. Uh, this is a Spanish study. Probably most of you are aware of that. They did a very wonderful job in ET as well as in PV and came coming up uh, with more information uh, from their Spanish registry. So 20, 25% of the patients are either resistant or intolerant to hydroxyurea over time by these measurements. And among them, and surprise to me, really unknown uh, to many our colleagues in community setting, uh, are uh, these uh, mucocutaneous ulcers. I have a picture of one of my patients who had an ulcer on the leg, uh, as is seen here, from uh, hydroxyurea in case you haven't seen it before. But nine out of 10 uh, toxicity uh, reports on the hydrea are related to the ulcers. And so 90% of people either have mouth ulcers or leg ulcers, uh, the rest is very rare. Right, one important finding for the future of the patients that are resistant or intolerant to hydroxyurea is this particular finding, again from Spain, that these patients that are resistant, here are the resistant patients, similar to ET, Patients then don't do well, they are resistant to site reductive therapy, hydroxyurea, they appear to have more aggressive disease. That is the bottom line. Biologically not yet defined what is wrong with them, but they progress faster than others and they have a shorter survival. That does not apply to the intolerance, obviously. This is just resistant to chemotherapy. So what do we do in frontline setting then? We talked about the hydroxyurea. It can be also interferon for PV. That's equally applicable. But in second line therapy, we have then choices. The first two, obviously, on this slide are common cess approach. Then busulfan was already mentioned. We do not like to use radioactive phosphorus much. People of Roman, maybe in Europe, still used occasionally. And as it is now known, ruxolitinib was actually approved in United States and Europe for indication of uh, inadequate response or intolerance to hydroxyurea, or in other words, resistant or intolerance to hydroxyurea, as outlined here. And uh, although ruxolitinib is there, let's talk about interferon. 
Pegulator interferon in advanced polycythemia vera. These are 43 patients published some years ago from uh, MD Anderson. And uh, here patients had a PV for about five years before going on a Pegasus. Most of them, great majority, already treated in the past. Follow-up at this point in time when this paper came up, and I'll give you an update, was 42 months, and you see good results, right? Complete hematological response, CHR, three-quarters of the patients. You need about 40 days to uh, have a complete response. You have complete molecular response, 18%, and partial molecular response, which means 50% reduction in ejective allele burden, and the kinetics of the decrease is on the right side of this slide in the jack to allele burden, which uh, may or may not have clinical res uh, relevance. The update of this study was presented at ASH, not published yet. Now we have a seven-year median follow-up. So hematological response overall was seen in a great majority of the patients, so that's not new, that's the first bullet. Then the molecular response uh, was there in, in a majority of the patients, but what is new is duration of these responses. So response duration of 66 months for hematological response, that's a median, and 53 months for the molecular, and only complete molecular responses were durable. In other words, the modification of the jack burden, unless it was, it was completely eliminated, did not really sustain that uh, decrease. They were going up and down over these seven years, and nobody really knew what that means. Um, on the other hand, uh, in terms of the real clinical outcome, toxicity does continue even with those modifications, so the dropout rate is 5 to 10 percent of the patients per, per year, and therefore median exposure to drug, even with careful management, was five years. No more than five years with the long-acting interferon. And we did have vascular events and progression, even in patients that had excellent hematological response, or even in patients with major molecular response, there, was, uh, uh, there were events. That's why Dr. Silver, who unfortunately is not here anymore, he would say, we did uh, uh, this too late. You need to treat patients with interferon from the get-go, from the diagnosis to prevent any uh, events or uh, to have a better chance of success. These people had already advanced disease and previously treated. Now, ruxolitinib was approved based on a response study. You are very well familiar with the study, just to brush up on what was the prerequisite for participation, resistance or intolerance to hydria, phlebotomy requirement, and the big spleen in this particular study. Patients randomized between ruxolitinib and best valuable therapy arm. Not to, um, I'm sorry, just not to dwell on this too much. The summary of the study is in the bottom part. So superiority for the five factors that we talked about. That's in the bottom line. Superiority for hematocrit, white cells, platelet, spleen, and symptoms. And in the safety analysis, that was not the goal of the study. In the safety analysis, there were fewer thrombotic events. And you can do real statistical analysis on that. But it appeared that there was a trend for fewer thrombotic events uh, in, uh, in the ruxolitinib arm. What is new here is the response to study, which may not be known very well, that was presented in oral session in June at EHA. Uh, a summary is here. The study was basically a copy of a response study, the same design, but patients without a big spleen. That's why it's red, in a red color. The same type of design, second line setting, phlebotomy requirement, but without the big spleen, and the results are about the same, almost identical to uh, the response study. So patients with or without the big spleen have the same type of response in terms of controlling the symptoms and the blood cell count. This is unpublished as of yet, but it is in public domain, as you can see here from the EHA. Practical point that is important, that starting dose for PV of ruxolitinib is 10 milligrams twice a day. Not like myelofibrosis, different starting dose based on a platelet number. Here it is and this is in yellow here, 10 milligrams twice a day. Why different colors? To say that the majority of the patients needs those adjustments. About 60% will go up on a dose, and only about 10% lower than 10 milligrams twice a day. So I think that goes with the safety, of, uh, safety approach in the more chronic disease. You start lower and then go up, like we do with interferon. Start lower, go up. So 10 milligrams twice a day, and then about 60% need more. And that usually happens within first two months. So in the, our own patient, 
he was intolerant because of uh, to hydroxyurea because of uh, the leg ulcer, and he was actually given ruxolitinib. Uh, he was on a clinical study that we had at the time, and uh, his overall symptoms as well as uh, ulcer uh, has improved, ulcer healed, spleen went away. He had a very good response in all aspects of the disease parameters as one would expect in majority of the patients. So to conclude here, hydroxyurea is considered and is accepted as a frontline cytotoxic therapy in United States uh, for high-risk polycythemia ovaria patients, although in guidelines interferon is the same level, but minority of the people actually prescribe interferon as the first choice. There are patients that do not do well on hydroxyurea, either because of intolerance or resistance, and resistance in particular uh, means poor outcome. Resistance, not intolerance. And for these patients that are intolerant or resistant, we uh, now have a ruxolitinib as approved therapy, and certainly one can also then try interferon in this uh, patient's population. So uh, with uh, that, I would just conclude with a possible algorithm for PV treatment in 2016, so diagnosis of PV. Obviously, didn't spend time on that, but you are aware of modifications in diagnostic process of PV published in April. Then assessment of the risk and symptoms, you know, symptoms coming up uh, as important quality of life issue for patients. And then we decide on a site reductive therapy in a dark red color based on a risk assessment as well as symptoms. Nobody um, can underestimate the importance of a quality of life of the patients. And the cytoreductive in the blue would be hydroxyurea or interferon if it's necessary, otherwise observation, but if things progress, progression has multiple phases. That not necessarily be only vascular event, it can be worsening splenomegaly, progressive leukocytosis, as we said, or even worsening of the symptoms then one needs to intervene with the cytoreductive therapy. Hydroxyurea is there usually, or interferon. And in second line, ruxolitinib. With that, I would conclude, and uh, looking forward to discussion after the last, last talk. Thank you very much.